Welcome to my three-part inferential statistics course. I'm Dennis Davis. Inferential statistics are how we draw conclusions about our environment based on limited data and how we can quantify our level of uncertainty in those conclusions. Inferential statistics depends on prior knowledge of both probability and statistics, which are two completely separate topics, but often taught together because they're both needed to understand inferential statistics. There are two types of inferential statistics, confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, and there's a key building block both of these depend on called the sampling distribution. So this video will cover the sampling distribution, video 2 will cover confidence intervals, and video 3 will cover hypothesis testing. Specifically, this video will cover background vocabulary and concepts related to populations and random variables, probability distributions and probability density functions, central tendency, variability, and bias, normal distributions, z-scores, and normal tables, samples, sampling distributions, and the central limit theorem. That'll be a good solid foundation for the last two videos. Outline on the left, Vocabulary words in yellow. The scenario we'll use throughout this series is a factory that makes 9 volt batteries, and we're interested in the working lifetime of these batteries when they're under heavy use. We'll start with some important vocabulary. A population is the set of all people, things, or events that we want to know something about. In our scenario, it's things, the set of all 9 volt batteries made at a particular factory. Populations can also be people, which is very common in the social sciences and medical fields. The set of all people with a particular disease, the set of likely voters in a state, students at a school, and so on. My own background is engineering, so I chose a manufacturing scenario, but the ideas, formulas, and math will apply to all fields. And populations can also be events, such as the set of traffic accidents at a particular intersection, or the set of weekend orders across a fast food restaurant chain. Individual members of the population have characteristics we're interested in that we can measure or observe. In our battery example, it was the working battery life. Different population types will have different characteristics. We call this characteristic a random variable. It's variable because different members of the population will have different values for the characteristic. For example, different 9-volt batteries will have different lifetimes. The opposite of a variable is a constant, and the lifetimes are not constant. The lifetimes vary, so lifetime is a variable. And random means we don't know beforehand what the lifetime of any particular battery will be. Not until we choose a battery at random and measure its lifetime. So we consider the working life of a battery to be a random variable. We can plot random variables on a graph like this. The horizontal axis denotes the values for the random variable, working battery life in minutes. Lower numbers denoting shorter lives to the left, higher numbers denoting longer lives to the right. The curve shows the relative likelihood of encountering different random variable values. Values here where the curve is higher would be more common than values here where the curve is lower. You can think of the area under the curve as being filled with tiny dots, each dot representing a member of the population, with the horizontal position of the dot denoting its random variable value. The curve is called a probability density function, or PDF. Not the document format PDF, okay? Completely different PDF. The term probability density refers to what I said about common values having higher values on the curve. As it turns out, the area under the curve corresponds to the probability of observing the associated random variable values. Probabilities are dense here, more likely. Probabilities are less dense here, less likely. Probability density. So when we say PDF, distribution, or curve, we're referring to this concept. So please think of a curve like this. Since a PDF depicts probability, the total area under a PDF curve is exactly 1. So, this is very important. The probability of observing random variable values in this range on the horizontal axis equals the area under the curve between the two points. 
because that's the proportion of the population between those points. PDFs come in different shapes, and they're not always symmetrical. Here's a right-skewed distribution with a tail out to the right. This might represent the distribution of household incomes, with most typical families here and fewer wealthier families out here. Here's a left-skewed distribution with a tail out to the left. And here's a distribution I made up. PDFs can be any shape, as long as they bound an area equal to 1. But a very common PDF shape is this mound shape, with a bunch in the middle and relatively fewer out towards the symmetrical tails. This shape is also called bell-shaped because of its similarity to a bell's flare. As you'll see, this is an important shape for inferential statistics and the one we'll use the most. Populations have numeric characteristics called parameters that the curve can help us see. The most common and useful for our purposes are the measures of central tendency and variability, which are covered in great detail in statistics courses, so I'll be brief. Measures of central tendency tell us where the random variable values tend to be centered. In your class, you'll cover mean, median, and mode, which are all measures of central tendency. But the one we use most often for inferential statistics is the mean. The mean is the average. The population mean has a special symbol, the lowercase Greek letter mu. Here's the formula for the mean. X sub i represents the random variable value, the battery life, of each member of the population, and capital N represents the number of population members. So, just as you'd expect, add them up and divide by N. That's the mean. For our example, I'm telling you that the mean is 386.5 minutes. Measures of variability you'll cover include the range, interquartile range, and the standard deviation. Measures of variability tell us about the dispersion or spread outness of the random variable values. The one we'll use most often in inferential statistics is the standard deviation. To review standard deviation, we start with another measure of variability called variance. We get the variance by taking each individual random variable value, here's one example, x sub i, and subtract from it the mean mu to get the distance in minutes between mu and the random variable value, x sub i minus mu. Then we square all of these differences and take their average by adding them up and dividing by the population size n. So this is the formula for variance. It looks complicated, but it's just the average of the squared differences between each point and the mean. Like a lot of things in math, the idea is simple, even if the formula looks complicated. The symbol for variance is lowercase Greek letter sigma squared. Because we squared the differences, the units of variance are squared. That's easy to remember because the symbol is sigma squared. So, for the batteries, the variance of their lifetime is in minutes squared. The variance of our population of battery lives happens to be 1,866 minutes squared. Since that's kind of awkward, we take the positive square root of the variance to get the units back to the same unit as the random variable. The square root of the variance is called the standard deviation. The standard deviation of a population's random variable has the symbol lowercase sigma not squared, since it's the square root of sigma squared. So here are the parameters of our battery population. Earlier, I said mu was 386.5 minutes, and the variance is 1,866 minutes squared. So the standard deviation is the square root of 1,866 minutes squared, which is about 43.2 minutes. The unit of measure of the standard deviation is always the same as the unit of measure on the horizontal axis of the PDF. I haven't really provided a sense of scale yet, so here are the 60-minute intervals marked out on the horizontal axis. Common values of a battery's life near the middle, where the probability density is high, less common out here, where the probability density is lower. The standard deviation has a physical meaning on the graph. I can draw a horizontal line segment whose length represents the standard deviation of 43.2 minutes. 
and we'll use the standard deviation as a measuring stick to measure out intervals on a special PDF, but not yet. Summarizing, a parameter is a numeric characteristic of a population. The two most often used parameters for inferential statistics are the mean, a measure of central tendency, and the standard deviation, a measure of variability. Each member of the population, that is, every point under the PDF curve, is a certain number of standard deviations away from the mean. This number of standard deviations is called the z-score. The z-score concept is very important. The z-score is an attribute of a data point denoting that point's distance from the mean using standard deviations as the unit of measure. We'll do an example, but first here's the formula. If we let x represent a particular random variable value, that is the lifetime of a particular battery, then the z-score of that random variable is x minus the population mean, mu, all divided by the population standard deviation, sigma. You need to know this formula. It might look intimidating because it has new symbols in it, but really, if I asked you how many standard deviations a point was from the mean, this is the formula you'd come up with yourself. Let's find the z-score of a battery that lasted 400 minutes. Plug in 400 minutes minus the mean 386.5 minutes. This is 13.5 minutes divided by the standard deviation of 43.2 minutes yields a z-score of 0.313. The numerator and denominator of the z-score formula have the same units. For our battery example, it's minutes. When dividing minutes by minutes, the unit of measure cancels out, and the z-score is a unitless measure. It's just a number, a number of standard deviations. Here on the graph, in blue, I'm plotting an x-value of 400 minutes on the horizontal axis. The distance from the mean to this value is shown by the horizontal blue bar. If I drew everything to proper scale, the blue bar should be 0.313 times as long as the white bar, which represents one standard deviation. Positive z-scores represent random variable values above mu, in the right half of the PDF. Negative z-scores correspond to values below mu. Let's find the z-score of 320 minutes. 320 minus 386.5 is negative 66.5. Divided by 43.2 equals negative 1.54. The random variable value of 320 minutes has a z-score of negative 1.54, so it's 1.54 standard deviations below the mean. A z-score of zero denotes a random variable value that's exactly equal to mu. That makes sense, its value is zero standard deviations away from the mean, so its z-score is zero. So, z-scores near zero are common because the probability density near the mean is high. Z-scores out here at plus or minus three or more are not common because the probability density out there is lower. Let me take a second to point out that, theoretically at least, these bell-shaped curves extend infinitely in both directions, so the curve gets closer and closer to the horizontal x-axis, but never touches it. So when you draw a bell-shaped curve for a homework or test problem, leave a tiny gap to let your instructor know that you know the curve extends further in both directions. This is actually a very special bell-shaped curve called a normal PDF, or normal curve. It's always struck me as ironic that the curve is so special, but its name is just normal. The normal curve is bell-shaped, but not all bell-shaped curves are normal. We'll cover some other bell-shaped curves in the next video. When a random variable is normally distributed, which means its PDF curve is normal, then there are some well-known rules of thumb metrics called the empirical rule. You should know the empirical rule. It says about 68% of the random variable values will be within one standard deviation of the mean. This is the same as saying 68% will have z-scores between negative 1 and positive 1, and that this shaded area is 68% of the total area under the curve. The empirical rule also states, again it applies only to normal PDFs, that about 95% of random variable values will be within two standard deviations of mu, and about 99.7% will be within three standard deviations of mu.
You should know these numbers and note that the empirical rule only applies to normal PDFs. Differently shaped PDFs will have different percentages of the random variables within one, two, and three standard deviations of the mean. There's a special normal PDF called the standard normal, which again seems ironic to me because it's the most special normal curve, but it's just called standard. The standard normal curve has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. That's what makes it standard. It's the PDF you'd get if you plotted all the z-scores of any normal distribution. The standard normal's horizontal axis looks like this, with mean zero and marked out standard deviations, which are essentially z-scores. Z-scores higher than four are so rare that when drawing normal curves, we usually don't go past three standard deviations. I said that the normal distribution was special, and shortly it'll spring up in a surprising way. So I'm asking you to believe me when I say that it's important to be familiar with it. We'll use these concepts soon. In your textbook, there's almost certainly a table of normal values that you'll need to be familiar with. You can also use Excel functions or a scientific calculator. This example I'm showing is at normaltable.com. Why is there a table like this? Well, I told you the normal distribution was a special PDF, and it has a special complicated formula. Every probability in the table is calculated using this integral. This is a hard function to integrate. In fact, when I was in engineering school, I was told, don't bother. The mathematicians have already done the work for us and put the results into a table of normal values. Nowadays, computers and calculators can give us these numbers, but I remember when that wasn't the case. We only had a table like this. I'll show you how it's used shortly. The table has positive z values, as shown by the small diagram, and it tells us the area under the curve up to any particular positive z value, as shown in yellow. In the table itself, the positive z values are in the margin of the table. I'll shade them blue as part of a memory aid we'll use later. And the body of the table tells us the area under the normal curve up to each particular z-score. I'll shade it yellow as part of the memory aid. Please think of these yellow numbers as probabilities. Since the total area under the curve is 1, the yellow fraction of the area is the probability of randomly selecting a member of the population whose z-score is less than the z-value. On a PDF, areas equal probability. And as a reminder, this normal table only tells us probabilities for normal PDFs. The components of the blue z-value are in the margins. The whole number and tenths digit is on the left side, and the hundredths digit is across the top. This is a strange way to build a table, but let me show you why it looks like this. We really have a list of 350 or more blue z-scores and their corresponding yellow probabilities. It's a long and awkward list. So they split it into horizontal strips so it would fit on one page. And that's why the z-score is on two axes. Let me do some examples. What percentage of a normal population has a z-score below 1.23? Let's find the blue 1.23 in the table. 1.2 here on the left, 0.03 here on top. Read across and down. 0 0.8907. The interpretation is that the probability of a normally distributed z-score being less than 1.23 is 0 0.8907. Equivalently, looking at the diagram above the table, if z were 1.23, the yellow area would be 89.07% of the entire area under the PDF. Can you see why this is the same as saying there's an 89.07% chance that a randomly chosen z-value from a normal distribution will be less than 1.23? Area equals probability on a PDF, which is why the total area under a PDF must be exactly 1. Here's a point that some students worry about. Do I have to be careful about saying less than 1.23 or less than or equal to 1.23? It's a good question with a surprising answer. Probabilities are areas under the curve, and the area corresponding to a single point is zero, or so near to zero that we can ignore it. 
so the probability that z is less than 1.23 equals the probability that z is less than or equal to 1.23 because the probability that z exactly equals 1.23 is negligible. To find the probability of a z-score greater than a particular value, use the table to find the probability less than that value and subtract that probability from 1. You can find the probability of encountering z-scores between any two points by using the symmetry of the normal curve to your advantage. Okay, we're almost finished with the normal table. We know how to look up the yellow probabilities for a given blue z-score. We'll also need to go the other way and determine which blue z-score corresponds to a particular yellow probability. For example, what z-score has 80% of the population below it and 20% above it? Okay, we have the probability yellow and we want the z-score blue. Let's find 0 0.8000 in the table. It looks like 0.7995 is as close as we can get. So let's read left to the blue z-scores to get 0.8 and up to get 0.04. So the answer is 0.84, the z-score higher than 80% of a normally distributed population. We'll use all this soon. Okay, back to our batteries and our population parameters mu and sigma. The fact is, we hardly ever know what they truly are. Populations are usually too big for us to measure or evaluate every single member, or it might be too expensive or just impractical. In our battery example, we couldn't test every battery's life or we wouldn't have any left to sell. So we have a conundrum. We want to know our population's mean, but we can't measure it directly. So instead, we take a sample. A sample is a randomly chosen subset of the population, and we examine, measure, or evaluate the random variable of its members. The sample has characteristics like a population does. As I've already mentioned, a population's characteristics are called parameters. A sample's characteristics are called statistics. The word statistics means several different things in statistics, and one of them is the characteristics of a sample. Here's a chart showing the characteristics of populations on the left, parameters, and of samples on the right, statistics. We're going to be saying very specific things about these concepts in terms of each other, so it's important to be precise with our symbols and terminology. The size of the population is denoted by uppercase n, and the size of the sample is lowercase n. Samples are smaller than populations, so that should be easy to remember. Here's Greek letter mu again, representing the population mean. We hardly ever know the value for mu. The whole point of inferential statistics is determining what we can about it based on the sample. The sample mean has the symbol x bar, a lowercase x with a horizontal bar on top. Since the sample size is lowercase n, as you might expect, x bar equals the sum of the n random variables in the sample divided by n. The sample standard deviation has the symbol lowercase s. The formula for sample standard deviation has a strange looking quirk. Instead of dividing the sum of the squared differences by lowercase n, the sample size, we divide by n minus 1. Here's a short version of why, and it involves a new vocabulary word, bias. When we take a sample from a population, the sample mean is an unbiased estimator of the population mean. That means a good estimator and in the long run should be a close approximation. Sample means tend to be clustered around the population mean. But the standard deviation of a sample, if we divide it by lowercase n, would tend to be less than the standard deviation of the population. So it's a biased estimator. In statistics, bias means measuring something different than the truth. There are a lot of different types of bias, and we won't get into them in this video. Anyway, we divide by n minus 1 instead of n to bump up the sample standard deviation to get it to more closely reflect the standard deviation of the population. The same reasoning applies to the formula for the sample variance, s squared. It just doesn't have the square root. Again, these symbols are important because the formulas we write will be saying very specific things about the population and sample. We convey our precise meaning by using the correct symbols. Okay, back to our batteries again. Suppose we took a random sample of 50 batteries, tested them, 
and found the mean life to be 382.9 minutes. Another color-coded memory aid, the sample mean, will be red. So I just said that the sample mean x-bar was a good, unbiased estimator of the population mean mu. Do you think x-bar is exactly equal to mu? There's clearly variation between batteries, and by choosing 50 different batteries, we'd probably get a different value for x-bar. So we'd expect x-bar to be close to mu, but how close? Here in red is the dot representing our sample mean, x-bar. Let's conduct a thought experiment. Suppose we took another sample of size 50 from the population and plotted its mean. Then another. And another. I'm plotting them in pink because pink is kind of like red, but not quite. They're not our actual red sample mean, x-bar, but they could have been, or they're similar to it. I think it'll make sense in a moment. Pink is our last memory aid color. Okay, now let's really stretch our imaginations. What if we took every possible sample of size 50 from the population? I don't mean we take samples of size 50 until we run out of batteries. I mean every possible combination of 50. So that, remember, this is just a thought experiment. We would never actually try to do this. Every battery would be in multiple samples, each with all the different possible combinations of 49 other batteries. Clearly impossible, but let's imagine it. If we plotted all those sample means, we'd get a new and different PDF, all shade pink. The new PDF is called the sampling distribution because it's the distribution of the sample means, more specifically, of all possible sample means of a particular sample size. Our actual sample in red is, of course, in the distribution because it's one of the possibilities. The sampling distribution is the key concept behind inferential statistics, both confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. I'm going to mention the sampling distribution about a thousand times by the end of these videos. If that's an exaggeration, it's not by much. Please make sure you understand. Here it is in context again. Whereas a population's PDF represents all the random variable values of a population, the lifespan of all our batteries, a sampling distribution, which is also a PDF, represents all the possible sample means of a certain sample size. Like all PDFs, the sampling distribution has a mean and standard deviation. Let's introduce some sampling distribution symbols by comparing it to the population distribution. Here's the population distribution and the sampling distribution. By the way, since each PDF represents a probability as the area under its curve, they must both have an area of 1. So narrower PDFs have a higher apex. We don't ever concern ourselves with the height of a PDF for inferential statistics. All we ever care about is the area under its curve. Okay, as a review, the population mean has the symbol mu. The sampling distribution mean has the symbol mu sub x bar. We can transliterate the symbol as the mean of the sample means. The population variance and standard deviation are denoted by sigma squared and sigma. The sampling distribution variance and standard deviation are denoted by sigma sub x bar squared and sigma sub x bar. Again, the x bar subscript denotes that the symbol refers to the variance and standard deviation of the sample means, all the possible sample means in the sampling distribution. Let me update the chart. Our data sets are across the top, population, sample, and sampling distribution. Our parameters slash statistics are in the left column. I'll draw your attention to two important color-coded memory aids. The sample mean x bar is red, and the sampling distribution standard deviation is pink. The size of the sampling distribution is the number of ways to draw a sample of size lowercase n from a population of size capital N. It's essentially the number of possible samples in the sampling distribution. I'll make a combinatorics video one day. This is a very large number and not at all important for what we're going to do. I just included it because the cell was there. So here are three very important facts to know about the very important sampling distribution. First, the mean of the sampling distribution, mu sub x bar, will be equal to the population mean, mu. That's shown in yellow. The means will line up. Please note, 
This isn't saying that our sample mean x bar is equal to mu. Our sample mean, red dot, will itself be a random variable from the pink sampling distribution. Remember, the sampling distribution includes every possible sample of size n, and our actual sample was just one of them. So our red sample mean is somewhere in the pink sampling distribution. We just don't know where. The second fact to know is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, sigma sub x bar, will be equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. This means sampling distribution PDFs, pink, will always be narrower than the PDF of the population from which they were drawn. The blue bar represents the magnitude of the population standard deviation sigma. The pink bar represents sigma sub x bar, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Length of pink equals length of blue divided by the square root of the sample size. So when we combine these first two facts, the pink sampling distribution PDF will have the same mean as the population PDF and have less variance, which we can see because it's narrower. The greater the sample size, the lower sigma sub x bar will be, and so the narrower the sampling distribution. The third important fact is a result of the central limit theorem, which is a vocabulary phrase. The central limit theorem states that sampling distributions are normally distributed under either of two conditions. First, if the sample size is large enough, the sampling distribution will be approximately normal regardless of the shape of the underlying population PDF. Not perfectly normal, but close enough that we can use our normal table and values and get good results. The second condition is that if the population is normally distributed, then the sampling distribution will be normal regardless of the sample size. I'm going to demonstrate these with an online applet by BFW Publishing, Bedford, Freeman, and Worth. Not sponsors, just good online tools. In the description, I link to their website, their YouTube channel, and the applet I reference in this video. The Central Limit Theorem app will draw 10,000 samples for us from one of three PDF shapes, exponential, uniform, and normal. We'll start with the exponential distribution here. Set the sample size to 1 with this slider and click the Generate Samples button to get a rough depiction of the population PDF. Exponential distributions are extremely right skewed, and interestingly, their mean and standard deviation are always the same. So exponential distributions are described with only one parameter, as shown here, 1. The app randomly selected and plotted 10,000 members from the exponential population, and their mean and standard deviation were 0.998 and 1.005, respectively. Pretty close for a random sample. Now let's change the sample size to 3 by adjusting the slider and clicking the Generate Samples button. The app draws 10,000 samples of size 3 and plots their means. This is not quite the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution would be the plot of all possible samples of size 3, and the app took only 10,000 samples. But that's close enough to give us a pretty good idea of what the sampling distribution looks like. The mean of these 10,000 sample means is 1.003. I told you a few minutes ago that mu sub x bar, the mean of the sample means, was equal to mu. I didn't prove it, but here's some evidence. Mu sub x bar is very close to mu, which is 1. And the standard deviation of these sample means is 0 0.578, which is an approximation of the standard deviation of the true sampling distribution, the pink sigma sub x bar. I told you sigma sub x bar equals the population standard deviation sigma divided by the square root of the sample size, n. Sigma is 1, and the sample size is 3. 1 over square root of 3 equals 0 0.577. Pretty close. If the app could somehow take every possible sample instead of just 10,000, the numbers would match exactly. Let me draw your attention to the scale of the horizontal axis. We're going to increase the sample size, and it may not be apparent that this estimate of the sampling distribution is getting narrower. So let's notice that the scale extends out to 5. Now, let's set n equals 9 and generate a new set of 10,000 samples. Again, this graph is an approximation of the sampling distribution for samples of size 9. The mean of the sample means, mu sub x bar, 
is still about equal to the population mean, 1, and the standard deviation of the sample means, sigma sub x bar, is about equal to our predicted standard deviation of the sampling distribution, 1 divided by the square root of 9. So, as we expect, larger sample sizes result in narrower sampling distributions, having smaller values for sigma sub x bar. And the horizontal axis range has been reduced. Everything now fits within a value of 3. There's an obvious tail out here to the right, which will be typical for sampling distributions from right-skewed populations. But the bulky part of the curve looks kind of normal-shaped. How close is it? The app provides this checkbox. When clicked, it'll overlay a normal curve with the mean and standard deviation we'd predict for the sampling distribution, mean mu and standard deviation sigma divided by the square root of n. At n equals 9, our curve is kind of close, but we have extra probability density here and here, and we're missing some here and here. This is typical of right-skewed populations. Here's a plot with n equals 50, a closer fit to normal. That's what the central limit theorem says. As the sample size gets larger and larger, the means distribution will get closer and closer to normal. Here's n equals 100, which is the largest sample size this app supports. Always closer to normal, never exactly normal. Now, let's look at some samples from a uniform distribution. I'll go faster for these. The PDF for a uniform distribution is a rectangle. Every value along the horizontal axis, real numbers from 0 to 10, for this example, has the same value within the population, and hence the same probability. With sample size 2, the distribution of the sample means is triangular. Here's n equals 9. The sampling distribution from a uniform population will approach normal faster than the exponential, since it was symmetrical to start with. One more time. The purpose of these demonstrations are to show the three important things about the sampling distribution. First, that the mean of the sampling distribution, mu sub x bar, will be equal to mu. Second, to show that the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, sigma sub x bar, will be equal to sigma divided by the square root of the sample size. And third, to show that as the sample size increases, the sampling distribution will become more and more normally distributed no matter the shape of the population's PDF. When the population PDF is normal to start with, the case for this last option, which is standard normal, actually, means 0, standard deviation 1, then the sampling distribution will be normal regardless of the sample size. As the sample sizes get bigger and bigger, the sampling distribution is always normal, but the standard deviation gets smaller. The threshold accepted in the statistics community is n equals 30. If we don't know anything about the population distribution, then the sample size must be at least 30 for the sampling distribution to be close enough to normal that we can use a normal table of values to determine probabilities and z-scores. If we know that the population is normal, then the sampling distribution will always be normal, regardless of the sample size. If the population distribution is symmetrical and mound-shaped, then the sampling distribution may approach normal with sample sizes smaller than 30. But 30 is the rule of thumb, assuming you don't know or can't assume anything about the population, which is often the case. And that's what we needed to know about sampling distributions, which are foundational to understanding confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. We'll start the next video with an interesting thought experiment, then learn how to construct confidence intervals.